Good morning everyone and welcome to our service of morning prayers this morning. And we just have a moment's quiet before I open in prayer. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker and our protector, through your goodness we are alive and healthy enough to gather and worship you. We praise you for all that you have given us and thank you in Jesus' holy name. Lord, we commit all we do to you and ask that everything we do be done for your glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and to be faithful to Christ as we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith. We renew our confidence and trust in his mercy and we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks God for Jesus Christ. Sing psalms and hymns and sacred songs. Let us sing to God with thankful hearts. Open our lips, Lord. We shall praise your name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Air of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior 
Perfect submission God is at rest I am my Savior I'm happy and blessed Watching and waiting Looking above Filled with His goodness Lost in His love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story this is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Go to read Acts 9, verses 36 to 43. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which, when translated, is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydia was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in, in Lydda, they sent two men to him and her, urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and the other clo clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So I'll just pray for Wolf as he comes to speak to us. Father, we thank you for Wolf and everything that he is to this church. And we thank you um, for his preparation and words this morning. May they be your thoughts and may you open our hearts and minds to hear them. Amen. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, and reading from verse 22. Hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the feast, the dedication, took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews therefore gathered round him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, 
and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, if it's fair to divide gospel readings into well-known and less well-known, which category would you put today's gospel passage in? Well, you'd say well-known? I'd, I'd say less well-known. And it's not completely unknown, but I think if you had to say you know, 50% in the well-known and 50% in the less well-known, I'd incline this particular passage slightly at the less well-known end. Um, now, I was once involved in a Bible study group where for a season we worked through the Gospel of John one chapter a week. And my overall impression of that exercise, it, it was a really good exercise, I really enjoyed it, was that each chapter had one or two sections I was really familiar with in which I probably could have pinned down to that chapter by memory. So, for example, the woman at the well, talk about worship, John chapter 4. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, John chapter 11. And I count myself as somebody who knows their Bible reasonably well, but I also found that in each chapter, there'd be a surprise. There'd be one or two sections which were less familiar. And with chapter 10, I would say the well-known part is the first half of the chapter. It's got not one, but two of the seven I am sayings of Jesus that we looked at in our all age services last year. I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. But then the story carries on. So this is a slightly later episode. And I think this section is a little bit less well known, but certainly worth studying. It inspired me to dig into it a bit. And that leads me to the question of how do you study the Bible? That would be a worthwhile question to discuss, but since we're also filming this for our online and catch up congregation, I'll treat it as a rhetorical question and give you some quick thoughts on how I approach a short passage like this. The first point I make is don't rush in too quickly. You remember the Lord's Prayer? It doesn't start, give us our daily bread. It starts, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The Bible is food for our spirit, so we should approach it first with prayer, perhaps even a time for some worship. God, who inspired the Bible, is sitting with us as we read it. His spirit lives within us, so we ask for his help to understand what he's saying to us. The next thing I do is to just read the passage and not too fast. I'm an avid reader and I'm quite a fast reader. I can zip through things like nobody's business. But I try to slow down to the pace of measured speech, like I'm speaking this morning, which helps me not to rush through too quickly and just run out of time. Or perhaps you find reading hard work. In that case, we're really blessed and we've got lots of benefits in this society. There are lots of resources to help us. You can literally listen to the passage, hearing as a whole, and not getting stuck on the awkward words. You can get versions on CD or online, you can get versions of the Bible for free. I particularly like the NIV UK version to listen to, narrated in the rich tones of David Suchet. Wonderful. Now, at the reading and listening stage, I'm not pausing over the details, but I'm looking for the big picture. Who's speaking? Who's listening? What's the theme? In today's passage, it's winter time in Jerusalem, and Jesus is speaking to a group of Jewish people in the temple courts. He's talking about assurance of eternal life and about God, our Father who is in heaven. I often read a little bit before the passage and a little bit after so I can see how it all fits in. So in this case, beforehand, as I noted, we get two of Jesus's I am statements spoken to a group of Pharisees. That was a separate episode and this is Another scene a little bit later on in the winter. After our passage, the Jews he was speaking to get really angry. They try to kill him, and that's all part of the same event, the same event which we're studying today. As at other times, Jesus evades them and returns to the part of the Jordan where John had baptised him. 
That's why in chapter 11, the next chapter, Jesus is a long way off from Jerusalem when his friend Lazarus falls sick in nearby Bethany. See, everything all fits together as you get a bigger picture. It's helpful to slot things into their places. And then, of course, comes the hard part, actually getting down to the work of studying it. You might have to read the passage several times in several different versions. You might want to consult other reference sources, although don't get too bogged down. I don't know if you're familiar with the Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. That's a verse for students everywhere. But what is God telling you about himself in the passage, and how is he inviting you to respond? What particularly came across to me as I studied the passage this time round is the basis of our assurance of salvation. And that word's that trusty old hymn, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. You might, if you're studying the passage, you might lean towards something entirely different and that's fine. It's entirely possible if you ask me about this passage in a few months' time, I'll focus on something else. Remember, this isn't a dead book we're looking at. This is a place to meet with the living God today. But for today, let me remind you of some of the reasons you can be sure about your salvation. Do you seek to listen to the voice of Jesus? If you sit down to study the Bible, if you pay attention to a sermon, that's a good start. Are you listening and ready to obey? That's better yet. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me, says Jesus in verse 27. What gets in the way of you being confident that you are saved? Is it the evidence of your own life? Things I don't know about at all. Things you might not admit to in public, but which plague you in the night. Let me tell you this, if Jesus has rescued you, then in the drama of your own life, you don't have the starring role. You're not the one at the center of attention, it's Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, if they do well enough, I will let them have eternal life. No, he says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. That's verse 28. What's his authority for making such a claim? The people he was speaking to knew that Jesus was a miracle worker and they knew that he spoke in a way that was different to any other rabbi, any other teacher they'd ever encountered. For us, it should be easy to get the answer because we got the benefit of looking back. We've got hindsight. We've seen how Jesus was the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. We've seen how he submitted himself to death on a cross. We've seen that he rose from the dead on the third day. His enemies couldn't produce a dead body as counter evidence. His friends met with the living board, even doing mundane things, or apparently mundane things like having breakfast on a beach. I hope you've met Jesus too. And if not, that you're beginning to find his call on your life irresistible. Jesus does the works of his Father, God. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And just in case anything was left ambiguous, Jesus concludes, I and the Father are one, in verse 30. His audience at the time became enraged and wanted to kill him. Even today, we can see people who want to kill Jesus and just write him out of history. It's no better, of course, just to treat him as an inconvenient truth and try to live as if he didn't exist. No, I think the place where we can walk in blessed assurance is to realise that you didn't find Jesus, but Jesus found you. It's when you've given your life to Jesus and you stop trying to borrow it back because you realise he can take better care of it than you can. Ideally, your attitude will be like that of of Paul, who wrote to his friend Timothy, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Does that sound sometimes beyond you? 
Let me close by reminding you of the story of a desperate man who brought his son to Jesus for healing. Matthew and Luke also record the story, but it's in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 9, that we find the tender detail I want you to cling to if you're saying, how can I know that I'm saved? How can I know that I have salvation? The man asks how his son can be healed. And Jesus says, everything is possible to those who believe. Hold on to the, the assurance which comes with this inspired response from Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. May we have assurance of salvation held on to by Jesus who will not let us be snatched out of his hand. Amen. Thank you for those words, Wolf, and lots to hold on to. So let us now confirm our faith together by saying the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So for our prayers this morning, when I say, Jesus, Lord of the Church, if you can respond by saying, in your mercy, hear us. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. Loving God, we lay before you the challenges that confront us at home, at work, and in our communities and churches. May your Son, the Good Shepherd, guide and shape the life of your church, that all may find a welcome and security in your presence. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. Renew your church in love, in, in the love of truth and the passion for justice. We pray for the war in Ukraine and for the leaders in Russia. We pray for all other areas in the world in similar situations and those still recovering from the effects of war. Take from us all hypocrisy and deceit and teach us to serve with humility and honesty to those whose lives are broken. Jesus, Lord of the Church, Help us to cherish all our communities who are vulnerable, to protect them and keep them safe. May we welcome people seeking something and may our churches be places where love is celebrated with integrity. We pray for all our activities here at church, that when people attend them, they feel the presence of God in their midst. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. Bring into your healing presence all who have been damaged and diminished for those whose lives continue to be overshadowed by guilt and fear. To those who are suffering in body, mind or spirit and in the quietness of our hearts now we lift them to the Lord.
And Lord, we remember that you know each and every one of their needs and our needs. May sorrows be shared and minds and bodies healed. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy hear us. May we all survive and flourish and discover your life-giving love and the delight in your gift of life so that fun and laughter and joy overflow to your glory. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy hear us. And a special prayer for the situation in Ukraine. <clears throat> God of justice and peace, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, for discernment and compassion to, de de to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. The Collect for the Fourth Sunday of Easter. Risen Christ, faithful shepherd of your Father's sheep, teach us to hear your voice, to follow your command, that all your people may be gathered into one flock to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And we uh, gather our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. And before we um, conclude our service, just one quick reminder in the fact that we have our um, annual parochial church council on Sunday the 22nd of May after the service. Um, and all the reports and accounts uh, and notices for this event will be out uh, on Sunday the 7th. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to him. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts and may the blessing of the Lord Jesus always be with you. And we end by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
his glory. 